beginning in Lent on, on February 24th, we're going to be studying a book together as a church called Evicted. And I wanted to invite you to do that. It's something that our high schoolers are specifically interested in doing. A couple of your peers are already ahead and have bought this book and want to lead some discussions. And there's some adults in the congregation too that are working on issues of housing justice, affordable housing. And you know how you've seen all these tent encampments around the Twin Cities. We do not stand for that. We do not want to live in a community where children don't have a place to sleep. Like that's so basic. And as part of your confirmation, we want to fill your heads with like concepts about God and all that. It's really important. And we want to show you how to put your faith to the, your feet to your faith. Like we want to show you how to make a difference in your community. And we want to say the people of God don't want to be depressed by statistics. We don't want to say that there's nothing we can do. And we also don't want to just sit here and complain and cry to God saying, where are you when bad things happen? No, God has placed us in our communities to do good things. And as a community, not just, not just the Christians, not just the Jewish people, all faiths and people of no faiths can come together and agree that we need to have housing for the, the friends in our community. People right in Highland Park, people right in Miriam Park, and so I wanted to just show you, this is the book we're going to be looking at. You can um, buy this book on Kindle. I got it on Kindle. It was like $7 or something. It's really good. It's written in story form. So though it's uh, it, introducing you to some concepts about what it's like to live in poverty and how people go from house to uh, apartment to apartment, um, it tells you like the stories of people that live, uh, they actually live in Milwaukee. But I'll show you this little video trailer so you can see what the book is about. Evictions used to be rare. They used to draw crowds. But these days there are sheriff squads whose full-time job is to carry out eviction orders. There are moving companies specializing in evictions the crews working all day, every weekday. All over America, housing costs have soared. Today, the majority of poor renting families spend over half of their income on housing. And at least one in four dedicates over 70%. For these Americans, eviction has become a way of life. Eviction causes loss. Families lose their home, school, and neighborhood, often their possessions and jobs too. Eviction comes with a court record, which can block families from safe neighborhoods and public housing. Then there's the toll eviction takes on a person's spirit. Displacement can drive people to depression and even suicide. Eviction is a cause, not just a condition of poverty. If we want to erase poverty in America, we must do something about the stark lack of affordable housing in our cities, because without stable shelter, everything else falls apart. Alrighty, so I hope that you will consider joining that book group. It's gonna be just a couple weeks and we can really make a difference. We have a team already working on housing justice right in Highland Park. I wanna be able to say that our teenagers care and we can prove that we care because we're learning about it and we're acting on what we learned. So hopefully you can join that. To do an announcement about, this one doesn't have any sound. You see this pretty picture. Listen, this is a very professional picture. I made this. It took me a lot of time. It did not take me actually a lot of time. It was a free image. And you know, you're a professional when you get paid to do it. So I'm a professional slide maker now. And we're building uh, an octave of pipes for the new organ for the, the new sanctuary redesign project. 
and your name is on there. I see ninth grade and 10th grade, B flat and B. Some of you have already made contributions. I won't divulge who, of course, but I wanted to let you know that this campaign is going on and it's really important. We want every single household and every single member and, so, and friends of our community to do something. If it's five bucks, if you babysit, if you are out shoveling sidewalks, or maybe you're gonna start now to help pay for this, make a contribution so that when it all gets installed, we can say we all helped a little bit. And we're, we're, we're hoping to collect those pledges before uh, Ash Wednesday by February 7th, I think. So that's your assignment. And now I'm done talking. Pastor Bradley can say something. All right. So you all are the B and the B flat, um, which are great keys. Um, to, uh, Katie, do we have time for a game? Should we do our game? I think we, we have to do the game. Okay, um, because here's why we have to do the game. We did this game for the seventh and eighth graders, and it was just too hard for them. It was because bad. they were young, they were immature, their brains had not been formed in all of the wisdom that the ninth and tenth grade tenth graders have. So you all have studied the Bible. So we thought we're not gonna just think that they can't do it. We're gonna assume they can. So, but this is a hard game. <laughs> so let me share my screen and I will explain it to you. Well, don't look at the answers. I gotta. Okay, there we go. This is the biblical child challenge. Okay, some of you are smiling already. Here's how it works. This is the way it gets scored. Is that if you guess the name on the first time, you get 40 points. If you guess it after the second clue, you get 30 points. After the third clue, 20 points. After the fourth clue, 10 points. Um, got it? So you have to keep track of your own score. You can uh, put it in the chat if you want. Um, so here we go. First clue, I was the oldest child in my family. Yes, somebody. Second clue, I was separated from my parents during a trip to Jerusalem. Anybody got it? Third clue, I worked in the family business. Fourth clue, these are all children in the Bible. The person I call dad was not my real dad. That's like the last giveaway question. So the answer? Jesus. Did anybody get that? I can't see the chat. Katie, you have to tell me. I mean, after the fact, everybody got it. <laughs> Um, okay, next one. First clue, my dad sent his servant to another country to find a wife for me. If anybody gets it after that, you can get off confirmation right now. Just tell Katie. That's right. Second clue, my mom should be in the Guinness Book of World Records for the oldest woman ever to give birth to a child. Third clue. I obeyed my father, this is a big clue, even when he put me on the altar to sacrifice me to God. Remember that story? My mother laughed when an angel told my father that she was going to have a child. Get it? The answer is Isaac. Remember the sacrifice of Isaac? Looks like Gus got that one. All right, Gus, yay. First clue for the next one. When I was born, there was already a death warrant issued for me. Number two, I was the youngest captain ever to navigate a vessel on the Nile River. Nile River is a big clue. After I was born, my mother hid me for three months. 
And last clue, I was only able to live with my parents for a few years, big clue, before I went to live at Pharaoh's palace. Egypt, Pharaoh's palace, did you get it? The answer is Moses. That's right. So I hope you guys are keeping track of your points, you know, in the tier of which one you filled it in after. So if you got it after question number two, you got like 30 points, I think. Yes. Um, I question number two. Go. I know. I don't know what that is. Yeah. Sounds so good, though. I mean, they're probably singing those sea shanties. <laughs> you guys want to listen to some of those? You stay on afterwards. I'll play one. Next one. I had a twin brother. Think of Bible twins. Number two, my brother was a hunter, but I like to stay close at home. Number three, I deceived my father so that he would give me the blessing of the firstborn, even though I was born second. I tricked my brother into giving me the birthright for a bowl of beans. Anybody know who that is? I've got some Cain and Abel's in there. Oh, okay. Well, those are good. Those are good uh, Bible twins. But Jacob. Jacob. Jacob and Esau. Remember them? Um, okay. Let's see. An angel told my mom she was going to have a child. And then he came back and told my dad as well. The angel told my parents that I was to be a Nazarite. That means I couldn't eat great products, touch dead bodies, or big clue, or cut my hair. Three, my dad tried to get a wife for me, but she was given to someone else. That is a ridiculous clue. And then four, after I gave away the secret of my strength, my hair was cut and the lovely part of the story, my eyes were gouged out. The answer, Samson. Gus got that one. Who got that one? Gus. Gus, good. All right, I think this is the last one. Okay. My oldest sibling died seven days after he, she was born. A prophet was sent to my father to point out his sin and he committed adultery with my mother. Okay, there's a clue you might know. My dad was Israel's second king. I was Israel's third king. That's the big clue there. You might be able to get it from that one. For my dad wrote most of the book of Psalms. I wrote most of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and a song that bears my name. Anybody get it? Yep. Gabby got it. Answer. Everybody. Okay. Sorry. I had to have, play us out there. We're trying to be like a TV show. It's not working. <laughs> nice. Nice. Um, so did any, what were your points? Anybody get any points? I like that. It's going to be like William or something. I don't know any Williams in the Bible. All right. Let me try something else here. Um, whoops. Okay. Um, before, whoops, that's not what we want. I don't know why it does that. It doesn't pick the ones I want. I'm getting there, getting there. All right. Okay. Um, just before we start jump into our lesson, let's just take a minute and breathe and just kind of center ourselves for a minute and and when you breathe breathe in god's love and god's goodness and when you breathe out just breathe out all the stress and negativity of today
Okay. Amen. Um, so today, our topic um, is confession and forgiveness. Um, if you think about Sunday's service, anybody remember how we end the service? What's the very last thing we say? Type it in the chat if you can remember the very last thing that we said. Katie, you have to tell me if I can't see the chat. Um, you know, I've got the answer, Jesus. That always seems to be one of them. <laughs> the last thing <laughs> we say in church on a Sunday morning. All right. I got to go in peace. I got to go in peace one. Yep, that's it. Okay. We end the whole thing by saying, go in peace. And then we add another, usually a little sentence, be the light, serve the Lord, live with just, live with joy, do justice. And then we all say, thanks be to God. Like our last word on Sunday morning after we've been with God's grace and word and sacrament is like, thanks be to God. We are now headed out into the world, ready to face the world, ready to be God's people, ready to live like a child of God in the world. We got this. That's how we end. When we come back to church the next Sunday, we begin like this. The grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. And then most often we start with by saying, let us confess our sin which seems like kind of a downer, right? We were sent into the world with grace and love and power, and we come back saying, let us confess our sin. It's like, what happened between last Sunday and this and this Sunday? Well, the truth is, life happened. Things didn't go like we hoped they would. We said things that we wish we could call back. We uh, hurt people. We, I mean, you can fill in the blank of all the ways that we kind of trip up or make mistakes or hurt ourselves, you know, by lying or not being truthful with who, who we are or taking care of the world. Um, I, uh, I love this little poem. Um, you loved each other? Yes. What happened then? I guess things didn't go as planned. So like in our relationship with God, which is filled with love all the time, it just doesn't always go as we planned it would. So we often begin our service with these words here. Um, I'm going to read this. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. So sort of, sort of was saying we are stuck in something. We've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we had, by what we've done. And this was an interesting one, by what we have left undone. Um, that's like, not doing things we know we should have, or um, not practicing justice when we know that we needed to speak up, or you know we we shut our mouth when we knew we really should have spoken up. We've not loved you with our whole heart. We've not loved our neighbors the same way we love ourselves. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. We sort of acknowledge, really, that we are stuck in something called sin. And this is kind of a churchy word that I think gets a bad rap because it gets thrown around to judge people. You know, um, you know like, you sinner. Um, is pointing out the bad things that someone else does. 
Um, some people think, wow, it's a, it's a downer to begin church by acknowledging that we're sinners because in the real world, we hide the things that we go, that go wrong, or we pretend everything's great because we don't want to see, we don't want people to see what's behind the, you know, behind the scenes, what's in our heart, which is afraid and struggling, um, but I think sin is kind of a good word to describe the stuckness or kind of the, the difficulty, the, the brokenness that's just a regular part of life. And for Lutherans, we think of sin as that sense of separation from God. We're apart from the life God wants us to have. Um, and that, so we have one big word, sin, which is a condition. It's our state of being, of separation. Um, and sins, this is the way most people think of sin. But for us, sins are the little, the way it gets played out. That's the bad stuff I do when I'm not connected to God. When I forget who I really am, which is a child of God. So sin singular is the condition sins is how that plays out in our life those are the things we do no matter how hard we try our sinful nature hardens our hearts it corrupts our actions again and again and so we need to experience death and resurrection that old way of being needs to go so that a new way can come into being so we start our service by acknowledging that. It's like, it's like saying, okay, let's, let's begin everything just by being honest. Let's, let's put it out there, who we are, who we've, who we've been. Now you think about starting a service that way and you think, oh my gosh, this is going to be a tough hour if it's about like having to be better and get over these problems. It sounds really hard. Um, fighting every day to be good, I'm not sure I can do that, struggling to be better all the time, working harder to improve myself, all of it, it just makes me so tired, and it makes Christianity a really negative religion, but that is not how Lutherans think about it, because for us, it all starts with baptism which is what God does for us. The only way we're honest is because we know God is holding on to us. So we're free to really put it out there because there's nothing at stake. We can never lose God's love. We're free to be honest. So that gives us freedom. Martin Luther says, every day when you get up, when you wash your face, remember your baptism, which, is, which, he's, which he's really trying to say, you, God gives you the chance to do the day, this day, all over again. You get another chance. It's Easter morning every day. You are new. Let's live in that rather than in what happened yesterday. Um, so what does God promise you in baptism? That your main identity is as a child of God. You're clothed with Christ no matter what. And you are forgiven. Um, and hear this, you are forgiven even before you commit a sin, even before you get stuck in sin. Forgiveness really comes before confession. I've always think we've got it backwards. We do confession and then we hear words of forgiveness. I sometimes think we should do it the other way. Um, in baptism, we're told you'll be given what you need to face your challenges today. You, God will give it to you. God's going to help you get through this. Um, you already have the whole love of the universe inside you. It's already there. You don't have to go find it. It has found you. And you get to start over every time, no matter how bad yesterday was or how bad it was the thing that you did or thought or whatever. Um, you will never be defined by the bad things that you've done. You're defined by what Christ has done for you. So that makes us free to live boldly and with love and with joy. So basically, by
by starting with confession and forgiveness at the beginning of the service is what we're really trying to say is, yeah, we're all stuck in this. We're stuck in it together. But the bottom line is, you've got this. Hang on. And God is saying to us, I've got you. I'm holding on to you. And I will never let you go. So that is my lesson for today on confession and forgiveness and sin. So awesome. thank you. So you can go into your small groups as sinners who are forgiven. All right. If, that's so great. Uh, if you're a 10th grader, your credo drafts are due on the 31st. There's nothing I can do about it if you don't get them into me. Wink, wink but you should try to send me something. <laughs> Give me some progress on how your credo projects are doing. It'll keep you on track. Um, the next step for you as 10th graders is you'll be signing up for one-on-one -on -one faith conversations with the pastors on Zoom. I don't have any of that ready yet, but you'll have your draft, you'll finish your project, and then you'll do your faith talk with the pastor. So keep on track with that. It will be good. And one of your groups is mixed grades. You'll survive. Make a new friend. Have fun. Thanks for coming. And Pastor Bradley, I didn't need to have you be a leader. They have nice little bigger groups, so that's just fine. All right. It looks like I was getting messages about Lois and um, Javen. I, I guess Lois the host. I had like three people saying, I've been in the waiting room for 15 minutes and no one will let me in. Oh, <laughs> I don't no. know what they were oh, doing. No. I have a feeling Lois is the host. She's probably just having so much fun and forgot to look at the thing. I'm like, <laughs> oh, well, that's no. fine. Uh, I, I have, let me update you really quickly about this beacon thing. Are you, are you doing that? Is that Javen? Do Javen, you, I don't, I know we're getting involved with it, but I okay. don't know, I really don't know the details of it yet. Okay, and I haven't been going to the meetings, but I have like the sidetrack with Elizabeth, the uh, organizer lady, and um, now Don Fulton is kind of trying to bring me into the loop a little bit, which is fine, because he said, they, the group of adult organizers wants to do this book study, and he heard that we were thinking of doing it with the high schoolers, which we were, but he said, could, is there any way we could do this cross-gen? And I said, yes, that would always be my preference. I, like, pridefully, I kind of wanted it to be like, oh, our high schoolers are doing this, but uh, I think it'll be a better experience. And Elizabeth Savarade really wants to lead a session. Okay. And we can, the book study that's online is not... Um, I thought it had, a, I thought it was, there's a group study for faith groups and I thought it was like five sessions and it has like read these chapters and answer. It's not, it's like 40 questions. So we'll have, I'll have to do a little bit of work to make it groupable, but uh. we, we will do it. It'll be just fine. So, and I think what we'll do is the only time that I could come up with it, I think would also work for our students is Wednesdays after the Lenten service like 7 30 to 8 or 7 30 to 8 40 and we'd have to do it on this channel because they sometimes use the other one for choir so and then well, um it's worth a shot but anyway yeah. so i'll probably have to start work with i don't i don't want to get ahead of the team i don't i'll talk to javen too because i i don't know what work the team is doing but we'll have to get some press out about that and, yeah i know he said that the group is and is engaged by it and really wants to get things going so okay. sounds like there's good energy with it good i like it all right have a good night i'll see you in the morning okay thank you best day ever <laughs> you too best good night. night all right so we have to go back over her Mm-hmm.